Thank you very much for the invitation and good afternoon, maybe. At least for me, it's afternoon. Uh, what I want to do is tell you about work that we are currently doing. Uh, we are doing that with a shared PhD student with Frank Fulisher called Martin Miranda, and in collaboration with the experimental group of Pascal Martin at Institut Curie. And what we work on is cilia, but these are artificial cilia, which are made of actin and not of microtubules. So the first thing I want to do is give you examples of cilia beating in biology. I have three examples here. This is a sperm cell. It has a long flagella. Uh, it, the flagella beats. It's made of microtubules. And what provokes the beating is molecular motors. In this case, it's thymines. There's a wave going from the body. The wave goes out, and this pushes the sperm. This example is a respiratory airway. It's the surface of the mucus. And you see many, many cilia here. They all beat, but they beat in synchrony and they make this wave here, which is called a metachronal wave. And in this case, what the cilia do is that they propel the fluid, which is close by. And I have another example of cilia that propel fluid. This is in your brain in the region called the ventricles. There are these cells called ependymal cells. And you see that each of these cells has a bunch of cilia. All the cilia beat, they synchronize, and they all beat in synchrony. And that propels the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, which is on top of it, that needs to move to, for your brain to work properly. So this is the kind of thing I want to discuss, why and how the cilia beat. Uh, of course, there are lots of theoretical models which are existing. As I told you, the biological cilia are made of microtubules and molecular motors. And at the background of all the cilia beating, there is a cooperative motion of molecular motors that drives oscillations. And the, this was predicted a long time ago by Jacques Pro and Frank Fulisher using a two-state model, which I kind of sketched in this slide here. Maybe I won't go into that. What I want to show you is molecular motors creating oscillations. The sketch, so this is the experiment that we done with uh, uh, Placé. The sketch of the experiment is here. This is a glass substrate. On the glass substrate, there are molecular motors which are grafted. These are myosin motors. And on top of that, you put an actin filament. And if you only do that, the actin filament walks around. It's called a motility assay. And the simple idea was to bind a bead to this actin filament, and you trap the bead with an optical trap. The optical trap is like a spring. And when you do that, the filament cannot go away because it's trapped by the spring. And the bead and the filament start to oscillate. So I show you the experiment. We are very proud of that. But you see, the oscillation is pretty small. It oscillates at a few hertz. And this is only the simple experiment which is here. Now, using the same type of uh, theory which is made here, you can calculate the shape of beating cilia. And if you take hydrodynamic in interactions into account, you can even look at synchronization between cilia and these metachronal waves that I showed you before. So that's what's known. What I want to show you now is a specific experiment, which is a biomimetic experiment. I'll show you the experiment, and then I'll show you how we made the theory of this experiment. So this experiment is not made with microtubules. It's made with actin filaments interacting with myosin motors. And then I'll show you how we make a rather simple theory for this thing. So the experiment is here. This is a glass plate. And on top of the glass plate, they label a region where they put actin polymerization promoters. If on top in the solution you put actin monomers, they go to this surface and they polymerize. They make filament. The surface gets covered with filament. And then what you see is actin filaments going out here. So if there's no motors, you only see individual filaments that go out. And if you add myosin motors, the filaments make bundles. So you see these bundles here. And you reach a structure that looks to me like the sun or something like this. So these are bundles of actin filament. And this is what I will study here. The real experiment that I want to show you is this one. The movie doesn't work, so I won't show you the whole thing beating. 
that each of these legs here, of what I like to call an octopus, is beating. So I think this one is this one here. And if you look at it, it beats spontaneously. And that's only acting, bundled by myosin motors and activated by myosin motors. A few remarks. First of all, the cross section of the filament is not constant. This is because all the actin filament that go out here don't have the same length. There's an exponential distribution of length. So it's large here, and then the, num the length of the filament decays exponentially, which means that if you cut at some point, the number of filament decays exponentially from the surface. Uh, and the way we measure that is by measuring the, the light intensity along this filament. This is not the first time that people make uh, artificial filaments or artificial cilia beating. This is an example that comes from the group of zoninia gogic, which is microtubules with which are bundled by, uh, uh, in this case, Chinese motors, and which also beat. So in the rest of the talk, what I want to discuss is how does this filament beat and how can you explain the shape of this beating filament? Now there's another thing that the experiment done, which is in fact what attracted me to this experiment, is that it can model molecular motors. So here it's not actin which is labeled, it's the myosin motors that create the motion. And I will play it. So you see the filament beating and the Bright part is the myosin motors. They bind up here when the curvature is large, and then there is a wave that goes to the end, and then on the other side they bind, and there is a wave going to the end. So associated to this mechanical wave, there is a wave of motors. Motors bind above a critical curvature, and they move to the to the end of the filament. This is kind of sketched here. What Pascal Martin did is he plotted here all the shapes of the filament at different times. So you see the beating, but you see different shapes at different times. And in this region here, before this big curvature, there is no motors bound. And in, there are several experiments which are superimposed. And in each experiment, the dot is where the motors start to bind. And you see that they all bind either in this region or in this region. And this means that motors bind only if the curvature is large enough. Another way to represent that is to plot the envelope, you plot the curvature as a function of time, and you plot the envelopes of these curves. So uh, not the curvature, sorry, the motor fluorescence here. You plot the envelope of the motor fluorescence. There's no motor close to the base here. And as when you reach this point here, which is this critical curvature, motors start to bind. So there is this result on the recruitment as a function of curvature. The frequency of the motor wave is twice the frequency of the mechanical wave because the beating is symmetric. So you bind when the curvature is large in one direction and you bind when the curvature is large in the other direction. And the last experimental result is that if you look at this wave that I show you here of bound molecular motors, its velocity is twice or roughly twice, I should say, the velocity of the mechanical beating of the filament. So these are the things that I want to discuss and explain with the series that I will introduce you to now. So the way I will uh, describe the, the bundle is a rod of varying radius. Locally, it has n filament, and the bending modulus of this rod is proportional to the number of filaments. This small sketch here gives you the geometry. So I introduce three variables at each point. One is the vector between the base and the point. One is the tangent angle, and the angle size that the tangent angle makes with the vertical direction, and the other one is curvature. So these variables are not independent. The tangent angle is the derivative of the position with respect to the arc length, and the curvature is the derivative of this angle with respect to the arc length. So the first thing I can do is I can try to write the energy, the mechanical energy of this bundle. So it's only curvature energy, 
is proportional to the square of the local curvature. I multiply by the bounding modulus and I integrate over the length. Then I want to take into account these constraints and I introduce Lagrange multipliers. So I have a Lagrange multiplier here, which I call lambda for this constraint. And I have a Lagrange multiplier here that I call mu for the second constraint. And this looks like a complicated way to do it, but this Lagrange multiplier has a very simple interpretation. This variable mu here is the force along the filament. So it's the tension of the filament. And this lambda here is the torque exerted locally on the filament. So by doing that, I introduce the torque and the tension along the filament. Then of course, I want to take into account that the fact that the width of the bundle varies. So the length distribution is exponential. Uh, I didn't talk about uh, length scale. The length scale is uh, 15 microns typically. And this decay length is something like eight microns. And the beating period to give you orders of magnitude is like half a minute, 30 seconds. So my movie was pretty much accelerated. So what this means is that the bending modulus, which is here, decays exponentially with the arc length. From, these, uh, from this energy, what, what I can calculate is what I will call thermodynamic forces. So these are the conjugate field to the three variables that I have. So this is the conjugate field to the curvature, and that's the torque. So this is the torque lambda that I was talking about. And this is a torque associated to the stiffness. I can calculate the force conjugate to the angle of sign. And this is the gradient of the torque. And this is the, external, the moment of the external force. And I can calculate the force conjugate to the position, which is the gradient of the tension. What I want to do is what I call an Onzaga theory. So I will write the dissipation. I will write fluxes and forces, and I will write that the fluxes are proportional to the forces. So I have three variables, C, Psi, and X, and the three fluxes which are associated, associated are the variation with time of the curvature, the variation with time of the angle and the velocity. And the forces are here. And I want to consider the fourth variable is the role of the molecular motors. And I do the simplest thing which is possible. I say molecular motors consume energy, and that's it. And there is a quantum of energy, which is how much energy do they gain when one ATP molecule is hydrolyzed. And I call R the rate of hydrolyzation of, of hydrolysis of ATP molecules. So I have four fluxes, R and the three which are here. And I have four forces, these three here, and delta mu. Now I won't write the most general relation. I will only keep diagonal term, which is this flux is proportional to the conjugate force. This flux is proportional to the conjugate force. And this flux is proportional to the conjugate force. And then I will couple them to energy consumption, which means I will couple them to the molecular motors. So V has no coupling because V is a vector and I don't have, I don't have any vector in this game. So there is, no, there is no active force on V. There is an active force on the curvature and there is an active force in the variation of the angle. So that gives me the equation of motion. I get three equations, they are coupled, but I have three coefficients here, which are the three possible frictions that I have in my problem. So the lambdas are mobility and the inverse of the lambdas are the, are the friction in the problem. So let me, take you to these frictions. The friction which is associated to X is just the external friction, it's the hydrodynamic friction. So there is a friction coefficient and it's not isotropic. There is a perpendicular friction and a parallel friction. It goes like the viscosity divided by some logarithmic correction here. The friction which is associated to psi, to psi here, one over this lambda psi psi, is an internal friction. And this is associated to shear in the filament. It's proportional to the number of actin filament in the bundle. And this is the one that I will keep in the following, 
because if the friction is proportional to the number of the filament, the number of the filament factorizes out of the equation, and the beating properties don't depend on the number of filament in the bundle. And this is one thing we observe experimentally, is that if you take different bundles, they all beat the same way, independent of the number of filaments that make the bundle. And this is a variable which is not controlled. So if we make this choice that the dominant friction is the shear friction, we reach a state where the number of filaments drops out of the equation. And that's in agreement with the experiment. The third friction is the friction appearing in the curvature equation. In a sense, this is the imaginary part of the, of the bending modulus. So it's viscoelasticity of the bundle, and I will ignore viscoelasticity of the bundle. The other type of forces that I described were these uh, active forces. So I have two. There's one in the curvature equation, and there's one in the angle equation. If these forces are constant, there is no beating. There is no gradient of these forces, and the, the bundle is stable. So in order that the bundle beats, you need a feedback on the shape of the filament on the active forces. And the way I will do it is I will couple this bundle to curvature. I will couple these active forces to the local curvature. Now, if I look at the force on psi, which is this one, this lambda a psi here, which is the one that creates the, the oscillation. Uh, in fact, it's a torque. And why is it a torque? Because locally there are molecular motors and each of the molecular motors can exert a force either in one direction or in the other direction. And the torque which is active is the sum of these forces, of this torque with their own signs. So there are motors acting in one direction our motors acting in the other direction. What I call rho A here is the density of motors in one direction minus the density of motors in the other direction. Maybe this is clearer if I make a small sketch, extremely naive. I take, I assume that the bundle is made of two filaments. So this is one filament, one acting filament. This is the other acting filament. These two filaments are parallel. And if motors attach to this filament, so they attach by their tail, they can attach on either side. Then the motor head goes and binds on the other filament. You see, what the motors can do is they want the filament to slide. So this one wants to push this filament in this direction. This one wants to push this filament in this direction. If there is the same number of motors on each side, the bundle is, has a steady state in this direction. It doesn't tell you that the steady state is stable, but it tells you that there is a steady state where the two filaments are straight. Now, if I go to the extreme other limit, I assume that all motors are on one side, then they bind on this side. They want to advance, so they push this filament in the other direction. So they want to create a shear, but of course these two filaments are on the surface. And the only way you can create a shear if the end of the two filament is stuck on the surface is to bend the filament, because if you make a transverse section here, the length from this point to here is smaller than the length from this point to here, and you slide the filament when you bend. So by bending the filament, you create a shear, which is what the motors want to do. Of course, if you bind the motors in the other direction, on the other side, they will bend the filament in the other direction. So this is essentially the mechanism of oscillation. This state is unstable. It's unstable because the motors want to shear the two filaments, and the only way they can share them is by creating curvature. So you can measure this here. So you cut at one point, and you measure on this filament is the distance to the base, on this filament the distance to the base. It is slightly higher. You can calculate the difference, divide by the distance between the filaments, which is your shear, and the shear is just the integral of the curvature. And the integral of the curvature is the uh, curvature is a derivative of the angle, is just psi of s minus psi of zero. So the angle plays exactly the role of the shear, and there are equivalent variables for this part. Two minutes. Look more at this uh, figure here. There is another thing which you can see. There is a symmetry in this problem. 
And the symmetry is what happens if you invert the two filaments. So if I go from this situation to this situation, you see that I exchange the curvature. So the curvature is changed into minus the curvature. If I exchange these motors into these motors here, I also change the active torque into minus the active torque. So whichever theory I make, it should have this property that when I exchange the two filaments, the equation should be invariant into this transformation that I change the curvature into minus the curvature and I change the active torque into minus the active torque. So one way to do it with this two, with the system of two filaments here, which, but which turns out to be the same thing as the general result, is that you can introduce a variable, which is a density of filament one. You can introduce the variable, which is a density of filament two. And instead of using these variables, you can use the sum of these two densities and the difference between these two densities. The sum of these two densities doesn't change if I invert the two variables. This is the total motor density. And the difference between the two densities, when I exchange the two filaments, is changing into minus the, dis the, the, the difference between the two densities. So this way here is exactly the one that I introduced in the active torque. And the active torque indeed changes sign when I exchange the two filaments. Then the rest of the game is that I will write the most general equations that respect these symmetries. So the mechanical equation I already wrote. This is the equation for the angle psi. I eliminated lambda and mu. There's a friction, which is what I call the shear friction here. This is the bending torque, and this is the active torque. And then molecular motors bind and unbind from the two filaments. This is what creates the fluctuations in the density of molecular motors. And I write equations for the AC, what I would call the asymmetric motor density, rho one minus rho two, or the difference between motors creating the torque in one direction and the motors creating the torque in the other direction. If you push this small model further, what it tells you is that the rate at which they bind is proportional to the local curvature. So there is a binding rate. There is an unbinding rate, which is proportional for rho one to rho, dt rho one is proportional to rho one, dt rho two is proportional to rho two. So unbinding is proportional to rho a. And we need a nonlinear term. A priori, all motors can bind. So that should be proportional to the total motor density. And then we put a nonlinearity here, which we played with, and we chose the one that explains better the experiment. We took a nonlinearity that goes like rho two. The last equation that I will write is the equation for the total density of motors. Now, remember what I showed you in the beginning. The motors are labeled, and the intensity of fluorescence gives you the total the total density of motors. So. The filaments are polar, so there is a velocity of the motors which is allowed. There is an on rate of the total density of motors, and there is an off rate of the total density of motors. We want two things for this on rate. We want that the motors bind above a certain curvature, and this is why we use this kind of field function here that tells you that at position S, the motors bind only if the curvature is larger than some, than some typical value. And it needs to saturate because this is what the experiments tell us. So we put some heat function with an exponent m, which doesn't play an important role. It should be large enough. Uh, in general, we use four. If I do that, I have three equations for the local angle for the asymmetric density of molecular motors, which is something that I don't know how to measure. This is the active torque. And for the total density of motors. So what I want to show you now is how we, we, what we get out of that and how we compare that to the experiment. So this is a numerical solution of these equations. So what you see here is a bundle. The width of the bundle decays exponentially from the base towards the tip here. This is the exponential variation of the number of filaments. And the intensity that you, see, that you see here is the acting density. Uh, this film is accelerated. The 
period of the experiment is 30 seconds before it goes faster, it's a little bit tedious to look at something that goes too slow. This here is the same heating, but the intensity now is a motor intensity. So if you look at this period, put the motors up to clear here, there's a wave that goes to the tip, goes in this direction, the curvature is large enough, the motors appear, and then the wave goes to the tip. So at least qualitatively, we have what we want. Uh, it's obvious on this picture that the frequency of the motor wave is twice the frequency of the mechanical waves because at each period, there are two waves. So that's kind of obvious. Uh, the velocity of the motor wave is a little bit less than twice the intensity, the, the velocity of the mechanical wave. Uh, this is far from being obvious. And in fact, we fought a lot on that. Where this comes from is this velocity here of the motors because the filament is polarized. Uh, it's not so clear where this velocity comes from. The simplest model that we have is some kind of allosteric model. When a motor binds, it's easier to bind at the next place. And that propagates the wave of motors faster than it would if it were only induced by the mechanical wave. I'm finished. I just show you that we can compare two experiments and that the shape, for instance, of the heating is the same as the, as the shape of the experimental results. So I can stop. One quick question and then, um, and then uh, save everything until the end. Yeah, okay. And so just to give you one question, Ralph P Raphael Petrosian asks, what is the physical origin of the curvature friction and how does it Order. What is the, the origin of which friction? Curvature friction. Oh, curvature friction. It's just viscoelasticity of the of the bundle. Okay. The, so when you bend the bundle, there's a bending modulus, but there's also viscous dissipation associated to that. So the and this is due to the the linkers between the filament and the, the, this viscoelastic component of the bending modulus is what creates the curvature friction. 